This is the Pixar Sciatica Podcast. Let's talk about pain management. There, when you are dealing with pain for quite some time, you might actually come in contact with a physician like this. And so what to expect during a visit? What are they looking for? And how is it any different compared to the other doctors that you may have seen when you're trying to deal with pain such as sciatica for a longer period of time? And today I have Dr. Sarah Merritt, who is actually out in uh, Bowie, Maryland, which fun fact, my uh, grand uncle actually lives out there and I had the opportunity to spend some time over there. But today, Dr. Sarah Merritt, pain management specialist physician, and she was kind enough to share her expertise with us today. Dr. Merritt, so great to see you. Thank you so much for being on today's episode. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Yeah. And, um, and I'm so excited because this is a, a world of and I know that there's so many different doctors that are out there, and especially when you are, in fact, yeah. dealing with pain, there's a lot of different concentrations that people go to. And so I'm excited for us to be able to, uh, one, dispel the myths, but also help patients understand what to expect and how they can actually benefit from working with a physician like you. But for starters, tell us a little bit more about yourself and the practice that you run. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I love what you said about dispel the myths because I think you're right that there might be a, a perception that that pain management is just just one thing, and really there there may be quite a lot of different ways we can work with patients. Um, so my name is Dr. Sarah Merritt. I'm located in Bowie, Maryland. Um, I am board certified in anesthesia, pain management, and actually also addiction medicine. Most of my practice, ninety percent of it, is acute and chronic pain management. And a lot of the, because uh, doctors like myself uh, who ha have trained in, in pain management fellowships have specialty training, very often we may manage medication for pain, but we may also do things like injections for pain. So um, a lot of those training programs came out of the world of anesthesia because we're familiar with doing injections like epidurals, nerve blocks, et cetera. There are also doctors that have trained in physiatry or neurology that may do interventional pain management and do injections also. Um, but my background uh, as a pain management provider is is through those things. Very cool. Yeah. And so um, listeners, if you didn't know the way physicians education is, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a long process. They put a lot of hard work into getting the credentials that they, they have certainly earned. So um, we're looking at uh, four years undergraduate, four years medical school, four year residency. Then after that, you can choose, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you can choose be, to be, say, like an attending physician, but then you actually have the opportunity to go into uh, a fellowship, which is another couple of years of actually a very concentrated realm of medicine. Is that right? Correct. Yes. And, and kind of, you can't just do any fellowship from any residencies. There are certain ones that, you know, can feed into certain fellowships. Um, so from anesthesia, the fellowships, you know, if taking as fact that I started in anesthesia, you can do specialties within anesthesia to do special types of OR surgery, um, but also pain management, because again, there's this um, interventional aspect that's kind of grown out of the things that that anesthesia doctors do in the in the OR. So yeah, um, past medical school, right, really, if you didn't do a fellowship or a, excuse me, if you didn't do a residency, um, there's not a lot, there are jobs you could do, but mostly it would be being a general practitioner, or maybe you could work for industry. Um, but to really practice, you know, most any doctor you're going to see has done some type of residency, uh, at least in internal medicine or family medicine, if they're a generalist and then other specialties, if they're a specialist. I just have to commend that, uh, physicians have the, the strongest, just like work capacity given given everything you've gone through. So just want to let you know that I really respect that. Okay. And so let's talk about like the, the pain, pain, management, pain management realm, pain management specialty specifically, because I think what's interesting is that, especially with the conversation that I have with patients, is that they experience a bout of pain, they experience about a sciatic pain. So then the first step that they go to is their general practitioner. Their general practitioner maybe screens a couple of red flags to ensure that nothing is wrong. Okay, they then go to physical therapy. They go to the physical therapist for quite some time. Physical therapy isn't helping. So then they go to uh, an orthopod, an orthopedist. They go to the orthopedist. 
get a couple different other tests. They're also told to go back to physical therapy because physical therapy continues to, to be helpful. And then at that time, it's, I think at that point, say, for example, the patient isn't actually a candidate for surgery, what's the next step for them, right? Then they end up getting referred out to pain specialty, uh, pain, pain management specialty. So tell us a little bit more about what is the, I guess, some of the major differences uh, mm -hmm. between, you know, general practitioners, orthopedists, and then your your role as a pain management specialist. I know that you do a lot of interventionalists as well, and interventions, such as injections yeah. and medications, but show us what this, some of the differences that patients can expect when coming to a physician like yourself. Yeah, so um, very often in the, the, I like this patient journey that you've described, that general physician who might be a primary care physician that the patient sees is hopefully going to know that patient uh, some from having a continuous relationship. Very often, uh, sciatica and episodes of acute low back pain will present sort of suddenly. And so very often that um, patient's resource is going to be their, their general primary care doctor that they might start with. And uh, that general primary care doctor, because they have um, appropriate training, is going to know that really the first line best interventions um, for an episode of acute sciatica um, or low back pain would actually be early physical therapy. Um, and that is one of the, the best recommendations. It can be okay to take adjunctive medications like an anti-inflammatory or a muscle relaxer, but we don't really expect that just the medication only is sufficient most of the time. Uh, and so um, as you're describing, uh, early physical therapy is really a good intervention in these cases. Now, if the patient gets better, then the primary care may not need to do any further referrals. If the patient's having a slow recovery or just isn't where they want to be in terms of return of their function or decrease in pain, then yeah, the next step for that primary doctor could be to refer to an orthopedic or to a pain physician. Um, and really at that point, the referral could kind of go either place and it, it might even depend on the referral pattern of that um, physician. Uh, the advantages of maybe seeing the orthopedist would be, um, you know, early screening of the patient for, um, you know, are they a candidate for surgery or, you know, if, if that patient's not recovering, it's, it's reasonable to consider, you know, are there uh, surgical options? And, and the orthopedic is in a unique position because an orthopedic spine surgeon uh, in particular would be in a position to recommend, you know, various courses of treatment according to their assessment. So a lot of times, if, if again, if a patient has acute low back pain or sciatica, early PT is recommended. An early MRI is really not like on day one, uh, you know, part of this workup and understanding of what's going on uh, to diagnose and treat sciatica. Um, those doctors are going to do a, a strength exam and be looking for red flags like weakness or asking about loss of bowel or bladder control. Um, some of those are signs that there could be imminent distress on a nerve. And if you have those things, um, you know, focal weakness, challenges with loss of bowel or bladder control, those are things that might encourage an earlier MRI, meaning, you know, right away or within a week or two of onset. Otherwise, without, with an absence of those things, um, very often uh, physical therapy and then following with an MRI in often four to six weeks if the patient hasn't resolved. And then usually at that point, if the patient's seeing an orthopedic, um, that, that advanced imaging, that MRI to look for, you know, are there spinal causes for the pain and sciatica is, is an appropriate next step. That that's going to be part of the orthopedics, you know, ability to assess the situation is, is by getting that advanced, advanced imaging. And then, you know, very often kind of in the scenario you're describing, then if the if the patient doesn't need an immediate surgery, then very often that um, that orthopedic or that spine surgeon might recommend a trial of an injection or further pain management if the patient's having trouble 
um, coping with their pain. This episode is brought to you by the Patient Advocate Program. Are you tired of not having support between your rehab sessions? Introducing the Patient Advocate Program, and we're focused on your recovery and we're offering you 24-7 access to a doctorate of physical therapy. Stop waiting in line to be seen and stop spending hours doing long exercise programs. Imagine being able to get all of your care delivered straight to your phone. Best of all, it's affordable. We believe everyone deserves top-notch relief without breaking the bank. So why wait? Take control of your health today and visit PT Patient Advocate advocate.com and book your free call with our experts. Yeah, that's uh, I really like how you broke it down because I think a lot of times when patients uh, go from doctor to doctor, it's hard for them to figure out what, what's some of the information that they're, that they should be giving to their doctor, Mm -hmm. to which doctor. And then I think a lot, a lot of times, um, especially by the time they come see you, they they have actually shared this information maybe even two to four times already yes. because they've already been reeling this information over a lot. And so I think um, by the, and I'm glad that you said like, if, you know, if they're not a candidate for surgery, then they they would be great to be able to work with you. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, I know a lot of orthopedists who actually will do some sort of injection and epi- uh, epidural yes. steroid injection or something like that. And so when they when they finally go into your clinic right when they're saying dr Merritt, i've been to my gp i've been to physical therapy uh i've been to the orthopedist i'm I'm here to see you um what are some of the things that you might particularly be looking for Mm -hmm. to help you determine either your diagnosis or your uh interventional methods what are some of the things that you look for that helps you guide your uh, clinical decision making, if if we call it, if we call it. Yeah, that. I mean, at the end of the day, it's really the the history and physical. So the talking to the patient, the examining the patient, and understanding you know the treatments or things that they've tried, um, and really all that's going to dictate and set up you know what their exact treatment plan is. Um, you know, more specifically, uh, often you know the those referrals that do come from a specialist like an orthopedist so it may even have a suggested injection, you know, that the orthopedist might have s- suspicion. Hey, I think an epidural in this location, and sometimes they'll even, you know, name a specific block or a specific epidural they think would be appropriate um, depending on the, <clears throat> on the referring doctor. Um, and in those cases, very often that's what we would, would start with is, is like, Hey, you're referred for this specific injection. Let's go ahead and do that. Other times we get maybe more of a general referral where the orthopedic has just said, Hey, evaluate and treat this person, do whatever injections. I think they would benefit from an epidural, but you know, they don't need to see me until they've had an injection or two and then send them, send them back. That's usually kind of the, um, the way the cycle works at that point. Um, because very often, you know, the, in terms of, surgery and, um, you know, interventions to like a discectomy to improve, you know, pain and sciatica. Um, again, even, even the orthopedist that you might think, you know, quote, want to do surgery, right. That's their job. That's what they do. You know, they, I sometimes have to like reemphasize to patients, you know, our interests are aligned, you know, like surgeons only want to do appropriate surgery or any surgeon you want to see only wants to do appropriate surgery. That's, you know, only when it's truly necessary um, and isn't going to be overly enthusiastic for that. But, um, and so in, in our practice, you know, again, those patients who are not having a right away type of surgery, uh, are often the people that come see us uh, for trials of things like injections or medications to see if they can get better. And some of them might still be candidates for later. Others of them, the surgeons might not have a, a surgery option. You know, there's not a surgery option for every pain problem, frankly. Yeah, and I really appreciate you you sharing that that process. And I think it is important for people to know um, that uh, listeners, what you tell your practitioner, whether it be a physician, a general practitioner, or even a physical therapist, it's going to be driving uh, the treat. And so mm-hmm. what's going to be very important throughout this entire process is that uh, in a way you have to improve in your skills on how you're feeling, how the pain came on and the things that actually make it feel better. Because 
yes, we have our own clinical exam. We're going to take a look at your strength. We're going to take a look at your range of motion. We're also going to take a look at how your pain behaves. But we need to get better understanding because it is a painful experience. We need to understand what you're feeling. And the more detailed you become, the, the better. Um, and interestingly enough, I, I remember uh, in my early days when I would ask people, like, tell me about your pain. They're like, oh, I have pain right here. And then it ends up kind of feeling like I'm kind of pulling teeth, just trying to get a little bit more information. It's like, okay, well, if you feel pain here, well, especially with something like sciatica, because it's a radiating pain, mm -hmm. um, it can it can be in the back, it can be in the leg, it can be all the way down to the calf. And it, it's interesting because I'll often ask my patients after, uh, maybe even during the same visit, I'm like, how are you feeling? And they're like, well, I still have pain, but it's it's more than it's more than just a light switch. It's because of the pain is so diffuse, because, yes. because it really impacts a large part of our life. The more you can describe what you're going through, the mm -hmm. better that both Dr. Merritt and I and our colleagues are actually able to actually treat you, which then actually brings me to my next question is because uh, you, like many other physicians, have uh, are, are huge believers in physical therapy. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really interesting is, uh, well, I'm just gonna premise with the fact that like not all physical therapists are creating equal. And yeah. so when a patient comes in to see you and they're at a point where they're saying, I don't know what to do, Dr. Merritt. I have been through uh, a, a, a number of weeks of physical therapy and nothing is helping um, or, or physical therapy isn't working. What are some of your initial thoughts when you hear that? And um, yeah, what goes through your head and how, do, how can we just help patients understand a little bit more about the pain process, the pain recovery process? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I a lot of times will ask more questions uh, at that point. You know, if physical therapy isn't working, okay, where are you doing it? Uh, that would be a, a follow up question. And, and what type of therapy is it? You know, um, I think there's a place for like chiropractic and physical therapy. But sometimes if I talk to someone who's had like entirely passive treatments, particularly, you know, this happens maybe more often at like certain injury chiropractic clinics, you know, if that's all the patient has had is passive treatments, then I might address that and like, well, you know, what are they doing in physical therapy? Well, I sit there and they put the TENS unit on me and then um, I get on the, the roller table and then I leave. I'm like, okay, well, that's a start, you know, that's a start of some, some treatments and some physical modalities, um, but it's not all there is. And so, you know, very often I'll, I'll kind of ask those questions. Where did you do it? What things have you been doing? Do you have exercises, et cetera? Um, or if the patient has been at physical therapy, well, yeah, I've been at a physical therapist. Um, you know, I, but I, I'm having trouble doing the exercises or I'm having trouble doing the routine. That would be one type of response. Another type of response would be, well, I'm doing it and I feel better, you know, maybe right afterward when I leave or I feel after good the rest of that day, but I'm not just sustaining benefit. Um, you know, that might be a, a, a more challenging type of place because it sounds like, okay, I'm getting some improvement. I'm just not able to like sustain it. So what do we do um, differently there? And the challenge too is, right, like I'm not a physical therapist, uh, right? That uh, I have some knowledge about it, but I'm not uh, as knowledgeable as a real physical therapist, of course. Uh, and I can make some decent recommendations, um, but you're right. Like a lot of it is pointing people in the right direction to engage with the right person. And sometimes even asking those like questions about just to get an idea, like, you know, hey, do you feel like physical therapy is benefiting you? And getting a feel for like the relationship even that they have with that therapist Right. Because like if they don't feel like the therapist is understanding them or hearing them like that all interferes with your recovery and ability to feel better. Um, right. Like you might have this decent, decent or good therapist. But if you're just not any the fit of any two people is difficult for an outsider to dictate. Right. And so um, for any one patient, there might be a more optimal physical therapist. And I would kind of add on to what you brought up here, right? Like not all physical therapists are created equal. There are certainly ones that that do more amazing things for sure. Um, there's also that fit aspect of that particular therapist pick, fitting with the particular individual. And this is part of why, like as a doctor, if I prescribe a medication, it's a very 
controlled intervention, right? If I prescribe 100 milligrams of Lyrica or pregabalin, that's what it is. And the patient's getting that dose every time because the FDA regulates how much is in that pill and it's just, it's the same thing. But if I prescribe physical therapy, it's not always the same thing. Uh, and we do have good studies that show physical therapy works, right? I'm not saying it's not effective, but but it's just, it's a variable intervention. And so it can be challenging to show how well it works. It can be challenging to convince patients that it can work for them. So I think for me, you know, if I talk to that patient who says, hey, you know, physical therapy hasn't been working for me, it's really a matter of like asking some more questions and, uh, you know, maybe thinking about doing a different type of physical therapy. Sometimes, particularly for my back pain patients, considering whether something different like aquatic therapy might be appropriate. There are times that, you know, trying a totally different type of, of therapy um, would be appropriate or just, just adding different modalities. I love that, Dr. Merritt. Uh, yeah, if you can even ask questions, get a better understanding of, of what's going on. I think what's so interesting is, uh, and, I, and this actually happened, uh, I think probably maybe about 10 to 15 episodes where I ac actually interviewed uh, Dr. Uh, Hamid Abbasi, um, who is a spine surgeon. And he was talking about, he was like, one of the big things as a spine surgeon is you would think we want to cut op people open and everything like that. But the first thing we want to do is physical therapy. But uh, there's so many variations. Physical therapy itself is kind of looked at as like a black box. Mm -hmm. People go in, they get better, or they people go and they don't get <laughs> there. And so it's like, well, what is happening? And I really appreciate how you, um, you, you kind of broke it down into three specific pieces, like passive modalities, mm -hmm. which for listeners out there, passive modalities are kind of like the ultrasound, the electrical stim, um, maybe some of the lumbar traction, the hot packs, um, all the stuff that actually just really requires you to lay there. And um, those are modalities that can be helpful when you are in some like such intense pain that you can't really do anything. But mm -hmm. once you've gotten to a point where you can move around a little bit more, those passive modalities, the long-term effects, the research actually shows that they're not particularly helpful when it comes to the longer term effects to get you back into restoring function. So if you've been in physical therapy um, or even possibly chiropractic care and you're getting the East and the TENS unit, the ultrasound, you've been doing getting that for three times a week for five to six weeks, it might be an opportunity for you to either find another physical therapist or bring up to the therapist that you're working with saying, hey, I think I'm ready for something a little bit more active, which then actually transitions on over into exercise. There's a lot of research that actually shows that general exercise actually does have a huge benefit to, um, to our health and to our recovery and to our pain, um, to our pain as well. Um, I think it is important for us to understand that uh, there, there is an endless list of exercises. And uh, I've said this a lot in the previous episodes, but when you are dealing with an active state of pain, when you are just standing here listening to this episode and you're like, I am in pain, this hurts. We need to find those activities and things that will actually bring your pain down, whether it be a stretch, whether it be an exercise to strengthen you, or even just a simple position. And that's where I think physical therapy can be particularly useful is that when dealing with pain, unlike sur like with surgeries, or even just like post interventions, we have some specific protocols backed by research to say, all right, well, if they are having a spinal laminectomy, the protocols are X, Y, and Z. But when it comes to just freestanding pain, we need to actually problem solve. We need to be able to say, okay, you're dealing with this pain now, we gotta do these activities, how do you feel as a result? Which then leads us to the third point where it's like, okay, you're feeling pretty good, maybe the, 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 the two to three hours post treatment, but then your pain comes back maybe the following day or the day after. Yeah, we can look at that from a, a couple of different things. Does that mean that you need to do your exercises a little bit more to keep the changes lasting for a longer period of time? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It could, it could be a possibility. Um, this is where I think um, where I think our uh, physical therapy as a profession kind of falls short because most of the time you get into the clinic, you see the, the physical therapist maybe once, twice or three times a week. And you, you're usually kind of just updating the physical therapist when you are there, right? And what ends up happening is that a lot can happen in the span of 24, 48, even uh, doing 24 to 48 hours or even a week, right? And so that, that means is that you get to your uh, appointment and you have to recollect one, two, three, four, a whole week of events that could have been happening and it gets, gets a little bit more challenging. So being able to say, all right, if I am experiencing like short-term relief when I do the exercises, but then when I go back and doing the other activities, I think it's important as like as physical therapists and for physical therapists to actually look at, all right, well, 
if you leave the clinic, you're doing fine. When does your pain come back? And it's like, oh, well, the pain comes back when I get into my car and drive for two to three hours. It's mm -hmm. important for us as physical therapists to actually say, well, let's see how you sit in your car. Um, some very yeah. simple changes like that to be able to say, what are those other triggers? Uh, which is why um, it's so important to be able to have a good, clear communication across your entire medical team yeah. to ensure that everything that you're doing uh, is, in fact, um, truly useful. And so, Dr. Merritt, this has all been extremely eye opening. And the goal with these podcasts is for the listeners to leave with some sort of action step, uh, things to do, right? And so they're, for the listeners who are listening and they're like, oh my gosh, I haven't been referred to pain management yet, but I'm still dealing with pain for a long period of time. Um, let's talk about some of the action steps and how patients can advocate for themselves to possibly get into speaking with the pain management specialist, especially if they've been dealing with pain for a long period of time. What are some things that or what, what's the most tactful way or what are some things that they can do to find a pain management specialist like you? Tell sure. us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, based on this conversation, you're talking about how we can, you know, evaluate and treat the patient. We work with physical therapy, injections, medication, et cetera. You know, it's good to like dispel the myth that, you know, pain management is all like pain medications. That is something that we do, but it's not like the number one goal, you know. Um, you know, how can a patient advocate for themselves? Um, you know, I, I do think that if they're not recovering adequately with appropriate PT, appropriate, you know, evaluation by orthopedic and or their primary care, um, just asking, asking their um, primary or um, orthopedic, whoever they're seeing on a regular basis, you know, hey, would an evaluation by pain management be appropriate for me? Um, because you're right, like very often patients may not even know um, what's out there or what's available and that there are doctors that can work with, you know, either pain medications, you know, we write referrals to physical therapy uh, and in, in fact, referrals even to things like acupuncture, you know, other modalities that, that can be uh, helpful in a patient's recovery if the standard things or the initial things aren't um, getting them where they need to be. Um, so I think that would be would be really my number one suggestion would just be, you know, kind of asking those questions, self-advocacy, you know, hey, would this be appropriate for me? And, and many pain management practices also will take a self-referral. Um, our practice does, you know, some will require a referral from your your physician. Um, but asking those questions of your your providers to start with, I think would be would be a great place to start. Awesome. And then uh, th the follow-up to that is, I mean, if you Google pain management physician, um, and you're, you're most likely, unless you're in like a very rural area, um, yeah. you're probably going to find like 15 to 20 different pain interventionalists. And yeah. so what, 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 how do you, how can patients sift through all of that, all of those providers to figure out yeah, like, who, who's question. the right person for them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, we, in my practice, I would say we have people that will find us based on our reviews that um, I don't know that we have the most reviews that anybody has, but they're they're good and they're solid. Um, I think, you know, patient reviews can be helpful. They're not all, not everything, but that's one consideration. Um, I think looking for someone who's, you know, board certified by one of the ABMS, the American Board of Medical Specialties Board, um, would be would be appropriate, particularly for the injections and things. I think these days there probably are not many non board certified pain doctors out there. Some years ago, before there were as many training programs as there are, there were a lot of you know non uh, fellowship trained docs out there. But that's just less and less as the field matures. Um, so I think looking for that, uh, depending if you you know if a certain hospital affiliation is important to you, and that that could be worth looking at. <clears throat> but I think also just, you know, who do your, who do your current providers know and trust? Um, we also get some recommendations where, um, you know, a family member or um, a family member or a friend will recommend us to someone um, that, that word of mouth type of piece. Um, so I think there are, there are a number of ways to kind of um, screen. And, and I would say also, you know, it's not too often that, that I have this happen, but, you know, we certainly can do like a new patient evaluation where a patient will, you know, come see us just to see if it's a fit for, for pain management. That's probably more so for a patient who might need like a long-term medication prescription where they just come for almost like a meet and greet. That's a, you know, a, a visit that goes through their medical insurance, but you know, they're not transferring their care on day one. They're just kind of 
coming to talk. Um, I think the other piece might be um, accessibility and how soon the doctor's available. Because if you're in a situation where, hey, my pain's really bad, my orthopedic and my PT both agree I might benefit from an injection uh, and I want to get in sooner than later, you know, reaching out and, you know, who has, you know, ability to work you in, who has an ability to add on a slot. In my area, um, there's a good practice at the hospital and they do a good job and and they treat a lot of patients, but, you know, frankly, it takes more than a month to get in for an injection at the hospital, you know, and not to mention that you're going to have like a fee for the hospital fee and the doctor fee. You know, the whole thing is more costly and a lot of waiting. Um, whereas, you know, for our practice, you know, we can often, our goal is to get new patients in in two weeks. Um, you know, we don't always meet that mark, but, but we try to, and, and again, if patients are calling and advocating for themselves and, uh, you know, I'll get requests from my call center if they take certain calls. Hey, this patient's really trying to get in. They have insurance X, Y, Z that we know isn't hard to get the authorization for the injection. You know, could we add them on sooner? Uh, and that's how we handle that kind of thing. So, so that really comes down to the advocacy on the part of the patient, right? They, they have to tell us. Uh, it's not just I have an empty slot tomorrow waiting for you, but for that patient who is um, advocating for themselves has that particular situation, you know, there are times that we can get somebody in, you know, same week for a consult and an injection. Awesome. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much for, for sharing with that because uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, as we know that when you're dealing with pain, everything is just, it's hard, it's overwhelming. And so to be able to really outline some of these steps and some of these action points, and to really just be able to sift through um, all the information that's out there, I think is extremely helpful. And the listeners will find that extremely helpful too. Um, Dr. Merritt, you actually have a clinic of your own out in Bowie. Uh, I do. Tell us, tell us a little bit more uh, about that. And for the folks who are you know, in, in the Maryland, DC area and are, and are looking to get your help or have questions, what's the best way to get in touch? That's right. Um, yeah, my practice is called Lifestream Health Center. We're online at lifestreamhealth.com. Uh, there's a form online to request an appointment. Also, our phone number is, is there. Uh, and you can give us a call uh, if you're interested in, in scheduling a new patient appointment. Um, we do like to see our new patients in person. Um, we, you know, take most all the insurances and uh, really try to be uh, in network as much as possible. And, um, you know, take care of patients, you know, mostly from the Maryland and D.C. area. And I do have a few patients that travel or spend part of the year in our area and will will come see us for part of the year or when they're they're available. Um, the practice is myself and we have um, numerous PAs and a nurse practitioner. And um, we also offer uh, primary care and mental health treatment. Um, we have a nurse practitioner, a DNP who. Um, is able to see patients for primary care and mental health. Those are, you know, not our main thing, but, you know, frankly, uh, our patients with pain management issues, some of them need to establish or reestablish with primary care, and some of them, you know, are interested in, in mental health treatment. And so we can offer, um, you know, multidisciplinary treatment within our practice. Beautiful. Listeners, I'm actually going to go ahead and put the link into the show notes as well. Uh, Dr. Merritt, this was awesome. Thank you so much for, for taking the time out of your day and sharing your expertise. Uh, I certainly learned a lot and I'm assured that the, the listeners have learned a lot about pain, the pain management specialty. So um, I would love to have you um, on future episodes because there's definitely a large part or a lot of different components of of your role, especially from like the medication management and the interventions. And yeah, perhaps in the future, we can talk more about those specific interventions and how they can be particularly helpful. Yeah, I'd be glad to. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you got some help from today's podcast. And for more info, check us out at ifixyoursciatica.com. Have a fantastic and pain-free day. No patient-therapist relationship is formed by listening to this podcast. We are not providing medical advice and all information should be confirmed by a medical provider.